of the Institute. And our subject this evening is education, which is very topical at the moment because uh, we've just had the election and uh, the um, election of a new SNP government. And the First Minister has made education one of the centerpieces of her administration. Uh, and with quite good reason, because if you look at things like the OECD report in Scottish education, which came at the end of last year, though that report found many good things to say about Scottish education, it also did point up some problem areas where, for example, standards were not improving and may even have been going backwards. So there are areas which could be improved in education, and then the attainment gap, which is close to the heart of the First Minister, remains stubbornly wide. So there, there are jobs to do in education, and she has shown her uh, commitment to that by moving her most experienced minister, John Swinney, into the role of Education Cabinet Secretary. Uh, John Swinney, in one of his pronouncements about education, said that it was open to new ideas. And new ideas is one of the reasons that we are here this evening. Uh, and slight change to our normal format. We're not just going to have somebody stand up here and lecture to us, and then we get to ask questions afterwards. Don Leddingham, who's going to lead the discussion this evening, and is very well qualified to do that, having himself been a head teacher and also a uh, director of education, but now having moved into leadership and management generally. Don is going to pose a series of questions which is going to make us work and, and try and answer for ourselves. And then we'll have a discussion facilitated by a panel chaired by Keir Bloomer, who also has been a director of education, but also a chief executive of a local authority. And the panelists will look at this problem from very different angles. Chris Chapman, uh, who is professor of education policy and practice at the University of Glasgow, We'll have Bill Nicholl, who's a trustee of the Hometown Foundation, trying to do something practical about communities and also education. Um, and uh, Eileen Pryor is chief executive of the Scottish Parent Teacher Council, so giving that sort of response. We're very grateful this evening for the sponsorship of the Tam O'Shanta Trust, which has uh, done a lot of work on education and trying to open the debate in education. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to Don Ledding. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to uh, stand up here, if you don't mind. Um, I, I'm really going to try and tell you a story uh, rather than blind you with detail. Uh, you'll be pleased to know, or perhaps not, that you'll get a copy of the proposal, which is an 18-page document with all the details contained later in the presentation, but I thought it might be useful just to try and describe the essence of what I'm describing initially in this title, Self-Improving Schools, but I think you'll see that, that that changes slightly as we go on. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give a little bit of background. Then I'm going to, as, as Ray suggested, just ask you a few questions, just to get a feeling from yourselves about direction of travel, where we are in terms of, of, of education in Scotland. And then I want to give just some the broad picture of the proposal, the suggestions that I'm making. Uh, I'll take some points for clarification at that stage, and then the panel will take over in terms of, of the debate and, and dialogue. So, if I, I take you back to a particular date that is seared on my memory. It's the 9th of November 2009, and I'm lying in bed. It's 6 o'clock in the morning, and I'm listening to... Uh, the alarm waken, wakens me up, and the radio comes on automatically, and I hear that Tesco are going to be taking over education in East Lothian Council, which was news to me because I was Director of Education at the time. In East Lothian Council. What the hell is happening here? <coughs> what had happened was I had been exploring the ideas of school autonomy for a long time. I'd been a head teacher, I'd been head of service, I'd been Director of Education, I'd been publicly exploring these for a number of years on my learning log, as I described it, uh, written a lot about it, quite publicly, quite transparently. But the council had been exploring possible savings that they could make, and it's been ever thus, certainly, in my time. And 
we were asked to come up with as many harebrained ideas as we could think of that would save money. And I put a couple of things together. I suggested that if schools were run as charitable trusts, they would no longer have to pay commercial rates on school buildings, and within East Lothian, that would relate to a two and a half million pounds saving. It was as much, there was, that's all the detail there was, and it was contained in a consultation document. A couple of journalists got a hold of this document and translated that single line as it was into a story that ran in just about every newspaper in Scotland and the UK in fact. And the more I read about it, the more extreme it became. However, to be fair to East Lothian Council, they had sanctioned this exploration of, of a model, which at that time we called community partnership schools. And the idea we wanted to explore what would be involved in establishing charitable trusts to run education. We had a large stakeholder group and over a period of a year we did a huge amount of work. We had a large conference at Queen Margaret University. However, when it came to the bit of actually saying, let's go for this, there were a number of fears and concerns which really acted against this. And, and I think these are very important fears when we talk about school autonomy. Firstly, parents were worried that they were going to be landed with the responsibility of running the school and the school budget and all that pressure would fall on them on top of their day jobs. Secondly, the unions and teachers were concerned that in order to operate as a charity, staff would have to, have to be chupy, they'd have to be transferred from local authority employment to employment by a trust. Their conditions and everything would transfer with it, the same salary, but it was a real blocking point. It was a stumbling point immediately. And thirdly, and one did surprise me, having been a head teacher, was that when it came to the bit of saying to head teachers, would you like to take control? Would you like to have that responsibility? There was a huge amount of reticence, a fear that we haven't been prepared for this. We've operated in a dependency culture for many, many years in Scotland, and all of a sudden you're on you go. And it was something that they balked from. Having said all that, there were really interesting lessons. On, on the feedback that we did with our stakeholder group and parents, there was a lot of agreement for giving schools more autonomy, particularly on the improvement agenda. Particularly on the improvement agenda. And that, that idea has continued with me as I've, I've moved, up, moved on. Um, and as, as Rick said, I, I was Director of Education and, and resigned a few years ago and now, now operate. And I'll make reference to this. I operate working with leading companies in the UK and internationally. At, and that has also opened up another perspective for me in terms of looking in on the problem from a different point of view. So let's come back to the need for change. Why change? Why change? I think there's, there's a number of reasons. If you go back to 2007, OECD visited Scotland and in what was a generally very positive report, they made one major criticism, and it was a huge criticism, in that they said the impact of local authority control education resulted in uniformity and conformity. Right across the piece, and that lack of diversity limited the scope for change and initiative and innovation. That chimed with my own experience as a director of education. Because, you know, and it really surprised me, it's a very interesting phenomenon. I describe it as regression towards the norm. Because what would happen is, I, I'm quite prepared to look at radical ideas and give permission for radical ideas. But within a meeting of head teachers, what would happen would be that someone would say, I would like to do this radical idea. And then a large number of other people would say, well, we're not happy with that because if you do that, our staff would like to do that and we don't want that to happen. So you got this regression, this pull, pulling towards a central picture which limited innovation because it created a, what I would describe as a comfort zone. And the council repeatedly was coming up with policies which created a comfort zone. And head teachers, and I was one who would say, I don't really want to do it, but the council are telling us to do it. It became a nice, safe space within which to operate. So that's, that, that uniformity and conformity was an important 
uh, important driver for change. The next one is about evidence. This is a toxic debate. We need to appreciate that issues about governance in Scotland is a toxic debate because it characterises it with as govern, um, governance, academies, the whole notion of privatisation. But what there is a huge lack of is any reliable evidence about impact of change. And I'm afraid we do not like to look over the border for those reasons. So regardless of any positive examples of change there, they don't go down well when you get into an audience of educators. So what happens? It polarises the debate. And we, ha we get two people in a room shouting at each other, saying, I'm right, no, I'm right, with a la any lack of reliable evidence to enable a robust and honest and mature dialogue to take place about here is the impact of change in terms of school autonomy and to allow that. So we just don't do it. And we end up just scaling up. The, the volume gets louder and louder in terms of, of that debate. The next limiting factor is the capacity of local authorities. When I first started my teaching career hundreds of years ago, there were an army of staff in every local authority, regardless of size. There were staff tutors. There were subject development officers. There were quality improvement officers. There were managing quality improvement officers. You name them, they were there. Vast arrays of teams to actually support, but particularly drive forward the improvement agenda. And then moving on, you in, in a small authority where I started my career, there were three deputy directors of education. Then you had heads of service below that. Massive structures operating on the basis that local authorities took responsibility for the improvement agenda. The capacity of local authorities has been decimated. And yet there's been no change in the expectation of the role of local authorities in terms of driving forward that improvement agenda. It's just not there. So these are, those are just some of the drivers of change that I identify in the paper and that we'll get a chance to look at. But actually, one, one actually, uh, referring back to my new career, working with companies, and it's been a real eye-opener for me because we have a tendency in public service to always adopt the higher moral ground, don't we, when we're talking about business? Because basically, they're greedy, selfish people that are only interested in profit. At least that's what we like to think. It's been a revelation to see me to look into business and see the real determination in most success, successful, sustainable businesses push and devolve responsibility for improvement to the lowest possible level. They don't hold it up top. They do not look at central control of improvement. They push it down. I was speaking to a chief exec last night that ran th a billion pound business, and he had 36 direct reports. And I was saying, how do you manage 36? direct reports. He said, well, I ignore 30 of them because they're doing a fantastic job. I don't go near them. I, I am involved with the other six. But as opposed to saying, I will, everybody will get that same process. So that, that need for change, I think, is a, a key driver. So what about the current state? What, what about the current state? So just to describe a few of those elements. And I think this surprises most people that I speak to in Scotland. Scottish schools have no statutory role in raising standards or improving education. I'll say it again because it staggers most people. There is, in the Scotland Education Act 2000 standards, which follows on from the Education Act in 1980, it explicitly states that the responsibility for improving education and raising standards lies with ministers who set policy but fundamentally, the drivers are the local authority. Schools, although they've got an obligation to present a, a development plan, that needs to go for approval to the local authority. The local authority validates, evaluates schools, and is responsible for changing and impacting. But the whole improvement agenda is driven, I would call it a vicarious responsibility, from local authorities. And despite having been a head teacher, where I see that an all worldwide research, and maybe Chris can back this up, demonstrates that real change and real improvement happens in the classroom, with the teacher, with the school, 
with the school leadership, in conjunction with the parents and the community. That's where real improvement comes from. And yet our system flips that and gives the responsibility, the vicarious responsibility, to local authorities. And I have to say my colleagues in local authorities do a phenomenal job there. They're passionate about it. It gives them their greatest joy. But the capacity is limited. But also I would suggest that there are some challenging factors, particularly in the way that modern organizations run, that actually limit us. So I'd like to um, just ask you a few questions. So if you're maybe sitting by yourself, maybe you'd like to nudge towards somebody else, you might want to speak in threes here. I've just got a few questions, I've got four questions that I'd like to uh, bounce off yourselves. And we'll just start to get a feel for the audience. So the first question, it's not a question, it's a statement, but the statement I'd like you to say either agree or disagree or yes or no. So responsibility for raising standards and improving education should remain with local authorities, but should be aggregated into larger geographical groupings, e.g. Strathclyde. And there's quite a debate going on at the moment about this, that, yes, we recognise that author small authorities like East Lothian or Clark Manage or whatever can't manage to do it themselves. So in order to give that capacity, we'll group it together. And I'll say no more because I'll start to give away what I might feel is. But if you could just, with your person next to you, just take three or four minutes and then we'll just take a show of hands. So if you could just discuss that, please. Is this okay? Yeah.
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, folks. If we could just just pause on that just now. Um, we'll we'll move to a show of hands, but uh, just if there are any comments here just now, we've got microphones either side of the room here. Just to to just we're looking here for observations, not questions from yourself, but observations in relation to this thoughts. So just feel free just to put your hand up and our, uh, our helpers will bring a microphone to you. Or we can go straight to the vote. Yeah, okay, thanks. I'm afraid I'm somewhat uh, trying to grapple with, with the statement, what are you suggesting should be aggregated? Is it the standards uh, or the schools themselves? No, it's the responsibility for rate that is the responsibility. So just shifting the responsibility from the local authority to an aggregated grouping but and increased capacity. But then you said it should remain with the local authorities. Yeah, well, it's rem I suppose it's remaining with the external group and the idea, I think, I'm, re I'm trying to represent what is being said, that local authorities are still in control, but it's, it's done through an aggregated group. So thank you for that clarification. That's, I apologise. Yes, thanks. If Curriculum for Excellence is about empowering people, then people should be empowered at, at all these different levels, and empowering and responsibility should go together. Mm -hmm. I think if, if uh, local authorities are legally obliged to take responsibility, then um, people can shrug their shoulders and walk away if they're not within the local authority. Yeah, yeah. So I, w I would be for responsibility being taken at, at a whole set of different levels in yeah. a structured way okay. rather than yeah. that solution. Okay, thank you. We'll take one, one more observation if we have. Okay, all right, one, one more up here, yes, thank you. David. David Scott, East Loden Council. Don, we, we put a lot of work, as you, as you well know, into trying aggregating yes. the work between East Loden Council and Midloading Council, yes. lots and lots of work, and it just took a change in the political winds, yeah. and all that work counted for nothing. Uh -huh. How do we get political buy-in into this? Yeah. Well, I'll try and suggest that uh, when I get to the proposal. Just keep that on your edges of your seats, because it's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's just see. So, uh, basically, um, how many of you would agree that rather than in keeping it within the smaller unit, it would be better to group it. Because that is a, that is a live idea, and Keir might want to explore it later on, that's, that's on the cards at the moment in Scotland. How many would agree with that? Okay. And how many would disagree? Okay, well, the, the, the nays have it on that one. So let's, uh, let's move on. So this one, if you like, is almost a hypothesis. Educational standards would improve if responsibility for educational improvement were shifted from local authorities to schools. So let me just add a little bit of a clarification again. We're actually talking about making a statutory shift here and saying the responsibility for raising standards and improving education moves from the local authority to the schools. A change in the Education Act clarifying that. So again, if you could just have a, a couple of minutes on that. Thank you. Ah, well.
Okay, folks, I'm going to uh, just going to going to push us on a little bit here. Um, so, how, how many people would uh, would agree with that that educational standards would improve if the responsibility for educational improvement was yes? You may yes. I think um, my neighbour and I, um, Alistair and I, we have some difficulty with these questions because they're not, they're presented as if they're either or, but there's no either or yeah, in these absolutely. situations. Yeah. In fact, this is a, this is yet another, it's like the previous one. Yeah. Sorry, I'm David Gow. Yeah. This is a, uh, this is a yes stuff. but. Yeah. yeah, I think that's and fair. A, you yourself said at the start, yeah. uh -huh. so this is what I can't quite yeah. understand, okay. that if the responsibility, no, the, the actual locus of, yeah. or any change and improvement is within the schools, well, you've answered your own question. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. Why are you asking? Okay, <laughs> well, two, two reasons. Firstly, I think it's about engaging the audience in terms of some of the issues that there are. Secondly, it is hopefully preparing the ground for trying to explore this grey area, because I would absolutely agree with you that it is a grey area, and that's why the notion of definitive universal change for straight on is a mistake. But this is allowing us just to tease out some of the issues and recognize that these are not black and white issues by any sense. Although I am presenting it as a, a dichotomy in terms of a, bi, a you know, a, 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 the, both sides of an argument, um, I'm quite happy to, it's really about, you know, and thank you for making that point, but it's, it's about getting us into this space which will hopefully provide fertile territory for me to explore the proposal that I'm about to make. Okay, so thank you. So we will go at the moment now just for Angus Tullock. Don, this is, this is a very hypothetical question because you've already said there's very limited appetite for change amongst head teachers. They wouldn't be prepared yeah. to accept the responsibilities. Well, this, is, this is interesting. There's very, from the small 70 schools in East Lothian where we explored this, very limited. However, we were talking about giving them responsibility for everything, the budget, the personnel. And I think for a lot of head teachers, if not, that scared them. There, a lot of head teachers are much more comfortable in this space about raising standards and educational, um, educational improvement. And so I think they would be much less reticent and certainly the the, the, the dipstick approach that I've done here in terms of speaking to many heads, they'd be much more comfortable about this than the global. And again, hopefully that's setting up, starting to explore what the, the shape of the proposal. So can I, I'm just going to move on, Angus, otherwise we're going to struggle for time. So can I just have a show of hands if you agree, agree with that statement? Providing you, Providing you get the budget. And who would disagree with that statement? Okay, so it's about 50-50 in there, and a few just... just Hands down, that's fine. The Scottish Government should first test out the impact of shifting responsibility for raising standards from local authorities to schools before making a permanent transfer. Can I just, ha just, just give me your immediate gut response to that? How many of you would agree with that? If Well, just a well, there might be a variety of ways of doing it, but it's, that, it's not, yeah, it's a test. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we're, we're talking about the majority of people agreeing with that. And Scottish schools should have complete, not just for raising standards, but Scottish schools should have complete autonomy from their local authority in terms of budget, personnel, and curricular issues, and anything else you care to mention. How many people agree with that? Okay. There's a, a handful majority saying no. So what we're trying to do here is then we establish some, some ground here in terms of moving forward to the proposal. So what I'd like to do now is, is sketch out the proposal, the detail of which is contained in the paper that we'll give you once I've finished speaking here just now. But it's just, just to try and give you the essence of what we're looking at here. The title of this presentation is called... Um, is, is called improving, self-improving schools. And, and that, that title comes from particularly work by a, a chap called David Hargreaves uh, in England. 
and it's become quite a, a very popular term, but it is often associated with the English model, which in and of itself shouldn't be a problem, but it actually potentially is a barrier in Scotland when we come forward. So the, the idea of self-improving and the evidence would suggest that when you give responsibility to a, to a school for taking this or to, having control over the improvement agenda, it actually demonstrates that it actually has a very positive impact upon student outcomes. However, there is an issue with self-improving being a bit dated, but also having this, this English dimension. And it also has, if you like, some definitive um, descriptions and criteria in order to be a self-improving school. We had a, a meeting with a few um, colleagues and interested parties a few weeks ago, and somebody challenged the idea around about self-improving schools. And titles actually do matter, particularly if they have associations with other brands. And for that reason, I think there's an interesting title to look at the idea of if we take something that we all know and have heard of in Scottish and worldwide education, which is self-directed learning. You will no doubt have heard of that phrase. You have control over your own learning. You take control of the pace, the content that you want to take, to take it forwards. And again, evidence would demonstrate that that has a very positive impact upon, upon the outcomes. But self-directed support and self-direction generally is a very common phrase now in the Scottish Government. I used to be also, as well as being Director of Education, was Director of Education and Social Work in two authorities simultaneously, which was an interesting experience, but that's another story. But self-directed support is the big politi political driver, particularly for supporting those with disability and additional needs, that the budget is given to them, they make decisions, recognising that they can allow them, gives them autonomy and control within their own community. So I want to shift the debate to the idea of self-directed schools. Rather than self-improving, self-directed, it's a blank sheet of paper that Scotland could actually start to fill in the gaps itself as to what it would mean. So as to the proposal that I'm making, the proposal I'm making is that, given that there's a lack of evidence, I think there is a need to conduct an experiment a prototype, something that's well known in the world of business, where we conduct an experiment to look at the impact of shifting responsibility for a number of schools in Scotland, primary and secondary, for a fixed period of time, to look at the impact that it may or may not make. It's not a pilot study. Throughout my career, I've probably been involved in 20 pilot studies with huge amount of money thrown to me. The biggest one, new community school, £400,000 a year as a head teacher and given one week to prepare a proposal for it. No experiment, no data collected to demonstrate whether or not it was successful or not. It's something that we don't do in Scottish education. We talk lots of pilots, but we're here at the David Hume Institute, the home of empiricism, of looking at evidence, of making reasoned judgment. So... There's an idea here, and if I, you know, the idea was generally that the hypothesis is, my hypothesis is, that if you shift responsibility for education or for raising standards of improvement from local authorities to schools, we will see an improvement. That's my hypothesis. But there is no proof to say that is, that is, or, not, is or isn't the case. What I'm suggesting is we conduct a prototype exercise with about 50 schools or more, it would be for others to decide, primary and secondary schools to see if improvement takes place. Now, interestingly, what does improvement mean? When you go to the Scottish Education Act, there is no definition of improvement. It doesn't exist. But I would suggest to you, when we look at, at uh, Education Scotland and look at Curriculum for Excellence, when schools are inspected, and I think this is a, a useful model, the key issue about improvement is around about the capacity of the school to improve. That's the key f feature. And there are three sub-features of that. It is in terms of the capacity of the leadership team to raise, to promote improvement. Then there is the idea of improving the quality of care and education. And thirdly, success and achievement. We're not just talking about exam results. We're talking about the achievements for all children. 
you would do a benchmark at the beginning of the exercise where you would look at how is a school performing. And again, Education Scotland would be heavily involved in that. And over a three-year period, you would then look at the outcomes of that group in contrast with a comparator group who are not part of the proposal. In essence, that's what I am suggesting, a formal prototype example. Now, many people would say, actually, that's far too timid. And I've not been accused of being too timid in my career. But actually, there are many stakeholders at the moment that would look for any excuse to block any initiative in terms of this area. You have to take account of that. So the programme would look for, in, for applications and it would ha we're looking at, in terms of the proposal, there would be a panel within each school and a, an improvement panel made up of teachers, parents, community members. Many parents and community members don't get involved in parent councils, and I'll leave this to Eileen, because they're not necessarily interested in organizing the school fate. And they don't have a, a substantive, substantial role in the improvement agenda. This would allow us to experiment and see, would that have an impact? Would, would it interfere with head teachers too much? Would it, be, uh, would it add something to it? Would we actually see that improvement? So the role of Education Scotland is crucial. The role of local authorities then, it would be shifting. For a small number of schools in every authority, you would be removing the requirement of them to, to submit their development plan. You would allow, you would give them space, and I'll just talk about that in a moment in terms of the kind of space that I'm looking at. Trade unions would have to be involved because terms and conditions would continue as is. They wouldn't shift. Locally negotiated agreements about terms and conditions would remain as they are. So you remove that obstacle, potentially, of unions saying, no, we're not prepared to get involved in that. In terms of the, the, uh, the freedom that you would have, I would be arguing very strongly for what's sometimes described as a loose, tight approach. It, we have a big, we make a, a mistake in public policy often with new initiative to move from one set of very, very concrete descriptors to another set of concrete descriptors. And I would be arguing that it's much more looser with some clear parameters and it gives space for people to start to create and innovate in terms of how the model might develop. In terms of partnership approaches, schools would continue to work with other schools in their local authority. It would be possible for schools as a cluster to apply to be self-directed schools, but it's not dependent upon that. Because if it depended upon that, we just need one school within a cluster to say, we don't want to be part of that. And a cluster is the secondary school and the local primary. An exit strategy. It's very, very rare in Scottish education to, to look at a change like this and to have an exit strategy. But I think it's really, and again, from a business point of view, I'm seeing more and more where people are prototyping practice, but there is an exit strategy. There is an opportunity to return back to the status quo if the evidence demonstrates that this idea has actually not added any value, that there are a whole series of problems that we did not anticipate that's thrown up. On the other hand, on the other hand, a properly conducted experiment, looking at something such as important as this in terms of how we go about raising standards, might just throw up the possibility that actually it is something that has a very positive impact upon Scottish education. It would be then for others, the government and others, to decide what might the next step be. So in summary, would shifting education, the responsibility for raising standards and improving education from local authorities who have the vicarious responsibility and shifting that to schools have a positive impact upon Scottish education? That is in essence the proposal that I'm making which would enable a robust and adult and mature dialogue to take place to enable us to move forward. Because if you look back, the current governance models, with the exception of school boards for direct funded schools in Scotland, is in essence the same and has been the same for 84 years. It is the one aspect of, social, of public life in Scotland that essentially has not shifted in that the statutory responsibility lies with an external body as opposed to the organization itself. And yet the school takes all the flack in terms of negative school reports 
but don't have that statutory responsibility. I'm happy to take any questions now in terms of the proposal that I've just outlined very quickly to you, but we'll also circulate the paper before we move on to the panel. So if I can maybe invite the panel to take their place, and I'm happy to take any questions on detail at the moment. Yes, thank you. Sorry, not a question, it's a comment, yeah. rather. Um, I feel quite uncomfortable with your proposal of an, of an experiment. Yes, yes. You're effectively making certain pupils into guinea pigs. Yes. Now, if the experiment go, I, I feel there are really uh, yeah. major ethical issues in yeah. this. Yeah. And if the experiment goes wrong, then the pupils who have been subjected to this experiment cannot go back and redo their education yeah. because yeah. one of the big features of childhood is you can only do it once. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So totally, it can't be repeated totally, if it goes wrong. Totally, totally agree with you. And on the other side of the coin, if your experiment works well, yeah. then equally the pupils who have come out of the experiment and it's gone well, they'll have an advantage. Yeah. And the ones who didn't go through the experiment yeah. have and, missed out. And, and they're also Thank you unequal. for capturing the essence of what Scottish education is about. Because that captures it perfectly. Don't make any changes, because any changes will mean some sort of change in terms of what we're doing. And what we want is we want a nice, uniform set of practice, which is controlled and in a box and easily described. Quite frankly, as a parent and as an ex-head teacher, I think it's a disaster. And I can see this now. As a public servant, I used to have to listen to those arguments and it frustrated the hell out of me because I'm sorry, but it is not the case. As a classroom teacher, I experimented all the time. All the time. I looked at data. I made judgments because that's where improvement comes from. You only get improvement by trying something, testing it, moving forwards. It's a cycle, but if we have the dead hand of, don't do it, don't do it. That has been the feature of Scottish Air. I'm sorry to be as quite as, as assertive as that, but I, and, I, and I know you're speaking from a, a deeply held conviction, but it has been one of the limiting factors in Scottish education that we cannot break free from. So I'm sorry. Thank you. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to move on to others. Okay, we'll get a blether after. Don't worry. <laughs> yes. Could I just check why you feel so strongly that there needs to be a statutory responsibility for improvement that <coughs> exists with some person or body, yeah. rather than in most systems, everyone has to play their part in improving the system that they're within. I, I, think, um, I think that sounds very reasonable. But I think what it does do, it, um, it, it, it still sh it holds a responsibility. I talked earlier on about regression to, the, to the, the, the mean in terms of policy and practice. Because it's held out with the school. So if I am a head teacher and I want to try something and it is at the edges of practice, I need to go and get approval for that if it's about the improvement agenda. I need to go and get approval from my boss, but more importantly from my peers. And I may not get that. And I think it provides a limiting f feature of Scottish education. So if that responsibility was shifted and we looked at what the results might be, I think it would be worthwhile, worthwhile for Scottish education to look at that. Remembering the application process would involve head teachers and parents and teachers agreeing, yeah, we'd like to have a shot at this. I'd have been pretty confident in the school that I was in that with that option, I think we would have had a really good go at doing that. And, and, and I would have been pretty, con I would ha I'll have to be convinced I'm making a proposal like this that it would have a positive impact. Sorry, we'll take, take one up here. I'm just, we've got five more minutes before we move on to the panel. Sorry, John. Um, I'm a head teacher in East Lothian, and um, we recognise, everybody in my school, that we can't make any improvements just on our own. Mm -hmm. It's not just me. Um, it's everybody within the school community, mm -hmm. and it's take, everybody taking responsibility. Um, 
it's not just the teachers or the parents, the children, it's all the partners that we work with. Um, and everybody has that, that level of responsibility and it's the understanding of that and it's giving people the ability to take ownership yeah. and leadership for themselves. Yeah. Now, from my point of view, it also helps me to have, David's my QIO, it helps me to have somebody to bounce ideas off, to talk it through with people, but I don't, because we talk as a team, we talk with professionals, we're not looking for um, other people to tell us what to do because we're measuring everything that we do in all sorts of different ways so that we're doing what's right for our children and if it's not working then we tweak it mm -hmm. because as somebody said earlier children have one chance at childhood so we're not going to fail them we're going to do the best for yeah. them in the situation that they're in and that's how we work and it does help yeah. to have people yeah. you know like David from the authority who are able to support yeah. that yeah. but you do need that level of autonomy if you're going to yeah. get it right yeah. yeah and and you know as as a former colleague I would agree and David is a QIO the challenge again is capacity to be able to do that. So the system is, is creaking in its current format. Um, could we take the back here, thanks. Just got a couple more minutes before we shift to the panel. Don, can I first of all thank you for, for your consistent passion in this area and also willing to challenge conventional wisdom and orthodoxies. And I think that that in itself is something that Scotland just needs much more of across a whole range of areas as a context for these kind of discussions. I'm though slightly um, uncertain as to, given your, your, your belief in the importance of many of these questions of leadership and culture and so on, I was quite surprised to see you default to a kind of structural solution. Yes. <laughs> and also just to I know education's your field, but I mean, much of what's been said today you could apply across swathes of other areas, uh -huh. um, both of public services, but I would argue even parts of the third sector now as well that are compliance cultures, yeah. um, dependency cultures, and my sadness is that a devolved Scotland, I think, has spawned a new form of dependency in terms of looking to Scottish government yeah. to do things and so on. So I'm, I'm wondering, in a sense, why you didn't major more on some of the generic leadership issues yeah, yeah. that need to be addressed in Scotland. And living slightly dangerously, since we're challenging orthodoxies, you know, if we're going to, this is a separate point, but if we're going to foster a learning culture, I mean, it's not just yeah. that we're not willing to look over the border. We could look at examples closer to home. Mm. A quarter of kids in this city mm. are educated in schools that aren't mm. under local authority control. Mm. What more could we do to share the learning there? Yes. Well, second point, I think is a really good point. We've got an issue there. Um, I suppose you could say I've been battered down by experience and become a shelpit kind of um, figure, just a, a, sh a skeleton of the man I used to be because of my experience. On the other hand, you could say, I think I've learned that, um, so I was going for wholesale change. I made a lot of mistakes there. I thought publicly and transparently, I didn't necessarily bring head teachers with me, but it was also too big a leap. And when you, we were kind of touching upon this earlier, Chris, you might want to talk about it, was a big leap from where we were. So it was into unknown territory, and that's scary. It's particularly scary for teachers, and particularly scary for teachers' unions. And, and it's a feature of Scottish education that the uh, trade unions movement in Scotland in terms of education are significant players. They have a huge role to play. You, ha you have to take cognizance of that, much less so than in other fields in terms of commerce, or even the third sector. But in education, it's a very strong feature. So I would admit absolutely guilty. It's much more timid, but I think it's much more structured and thought through than the big leap, come and follow me, which I think scared a lot of people. So it's that providing a bit of territory. And even, even if that step for some people is too far, it's providing a bit of safe ground for some people to start to occupy in terms of alternative approaches. Because I've got no personal agenda. <laughs> The interesting thing here now, I've got no personal agenda with this. My, my, my life um, is dedicated to another field of business. So, as you say, it's a passion, it's an interest, and I'm just fortunate to be invited by, by Ray. I'll take one more question here, thank you. Could I ask you, I, 
and let's say it didn't hear it, how long you thought the process yeah. would it be a cohort from initial primary to end? Of the uh, um, how, would, long the, the, yeah. how long yeah. you thought I, it would need I, to be? I was, I, in the proposal, I was suggesting three years. Now, some people have said it's too short. Some people have said it's too long. The evidence for the reason I've gone for three years is that head teachers, when I, you know, I've appointed, I don't know how many head teachers, hundreds actually, when I think about it. The impact that a head teacher makes in a two or a three year period is unbelievable. You can see it. So within three years, I would be pretty convinced that we would start to see some impact. I, I, to, to address your concern, I would be very, very surprised to see a diminution of service, particularly when we're looking, at, and the, you'll see in the proposal, there are some safety nets in, per the, the, the school board and the parents being able to call in support and actually for an early exit if things aren't working. So that, that's built in. But in, in that three-year programme, I think it would be possible to gather enough evidence, give enough time to actually gen generate some robust evidence. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm happy to speak to anyone um, after this, but I'm going to hand over now to, to Keir Bloomer. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, John. Uh, my name is Keir Bloomer. I am the convener of the Education Committee of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and I have been asked to chair this discussion part uh, of the evening. As you see, I have a distinguished panel with very varied opinions among them. So to start this part of the evening off, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and maybe also to give a brief reaction to what Don has said, but to take not more than three minutes each. We'll start with you, Annie. Okay. I work with the Scottish Parent Teacher Council. Um, I work with the Scottish Parent Teacher Council, um, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools. However, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, private school if they wish. They don't want to run schools, however, they do want to be involved. They want to be partners in their children's education. They want their capacities. They will say they're happy with their school. Um, they will say they're happy with their school. Um, they will say they're happy with their school. Um, they will say they're happy with their school. Um, they will say they're happy with their school. Um, you grade will say they're happy with their school. Um, you could say they're uncritical, but they are generally pretty happy with their school. But they will man the barricades if you try to close their school or merge their school or um, do something that they don't like. And so parents will come out um, and will absolutely make their voices heard. Um, so. You know, they are there um, and they are an audience that you, ha not just an audience, they are a partner that you have to factor into your discussions. There is also a feeling that local authorities do not necessarily serve school education well. Um, and that in fact, very often the short termism that operates within the political system puts forces or pushes local authorities down decision routes which are not for the long-term benefit 
of young people. So local authorities are perhaps not the best home for education. Have I taken up all, your, all my three minutes? I would say so. Okay, <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> right, thank you. We'll pass to my right to Chris Chapman. Thank, thanks very much, Keir. Um, Chris Chapman um, from the Robert Owens Centre for Educational Change at the University of Glasgow. Um, I understand that I'm here on this panel as um, somebody who's relatively new to Scotland, and um, I, I bring my sort of perspective for, from, from my research largely um, in Manchester, where we um, undertook a lot of work in um, school to school collaboration, federations, and, and, and academy chains, and, and so forth and where I, all, I was also um, a governor of, of an academy. So it's with that perspective that I sit on, on, on this panel, really speaking in a, in a per, personal um, capacity. Uh, my, my, my sort of re initial reaction and, and reflections to um, Don, Don's um, very passionate um, and engaging pre presentation is that the, the, the premise of the self-improving school system in England was based upon the idea that the best schools led the improvement of the system. So it wasn't an individualistic endeavor. It was very much a collective endeavor. And, you can, and that, that's written large into the um, 2010 Act where they quote um, federations and chains as being the, dri the, the drivers for change. So, so I, I would just sort of throw that into the melting pot as we start. That, you know, I, I think the model would be strengthened if it was collective and we did work, <coughs> and we did work, in, did work in clusters. Um, that's probably three minutes, isn't it? Yeah. yeah let's, get, let's get on to the discussion. Bill. It's quicker three minutes than yeah. well, I was compensating. <laughs> Time speeded up a little bit, yes. I'm happy to speed it up even more. But, uh, my name is Bill Nicholl. Uh, I'm the director of the Hometown Foundation, which is a Scottish charity set up by a group of philanthropic businessmen. Uh, and the whole idea about the Hometown Foundation is that we want to improve the life chances of individuals and communities by giving them more control over things that are important to them. So our first priorities were looking at housing, affordable housing, and to look at the education system. And I would totally agree with the comments made earlier. Uh, you know, children do have one chance. Uh, I think the ownership of education needs to be a team effort. Uh, and it is about, you know, the teachers fully in charge, but supportive parents and receptive pupils. And if you've been trying to do over the last year and a half, is rather than just theorising, trying to do over the last year and a half, is rather than just theorising about things that's practical application. I think we've got enough theories, and it's trying to put some of that into practice. So what I've been trying to do is to stimulate as many. Uh, groups to come forward that actually want to have state-funded autonomous schools. So I, I'm back in the camp that Don was in a few years back. A less timid approach. Uh, it might not be something that he gets approved, but we, we're hopeful. So <clears throat> over the last year and a half, I've now submitted something like four business plans to the First Minister. There is no process to follow. It's not like the, the situation in England. So there's four business plans there. There's another four ready to go into the new uh, minister, who I think will be far better than the, the previous one. But that's a personal view. So I think John Swinney, with his background and and his mindset and, and his approach that he can bring to matters, I think that will help greatly. The, the First Minister has said that she is open to, to ideas that could work, uh, so I'm trying to stimulate as many business plans to have fully state-funded autonomous schools and as many as possible by, by the end of the summer. The big challenge that we've got is vested interests, unions and local authorities, and this resistance, this uh, change bias that seems to exist out there. I think we've got a good idea of what the problem is. I think we've got a good idea of what the solutions are. For me, waiting three, three and a half years for, for a limited amount of people possibly isn't enough. But at the same time, the work that Angus and Don has done has really put us to where we are just now. It really depends whether people have got the balls to take it to the next stage and do something a wee bit more sort of reactive, something a wee bit more progressive. Right. Thank you very much. So over to you now. What I propose to do is to take questions or ideally comment from maybe three or four people first, then get some more reactions from the panel, then I'll go back to you. But can you please wait for the microphone to come to you? And can you also please, when you speak, begin by telling us who you are? So, Melvin. Melvin. 
for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, 
for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, for the future rather than the school managers that we needed for the, um, just 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 as an, as an aside the question was about um, just 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 as an, as an aside the question was about um, re re responsibility and autonomy we didn't mention account uh, uh, accountability and um, a, a finished phd student at Man manchester who said there is no direct translation for the word autonomy in finland the nearest thing is responsibility and i think that's just quite an interesting aside I think from my perspective, to answer the questions, uh, things should be pretty straightforward. I think if you keep them basic, they should be, everyone should know where that resides, and that's part of the problem. That we, everyone should know where that resides, and that's part of the problem that we have just now. I think there's another concern for me, because I know there's a lot of teachers out there, and I, I must socialise with a different group of teachers, because there's another group of teachers out there that do want this change to happen. They are up for the change, but what they're essentially looking for is almost some sort of sanction from the top, from the First Minister, from the government, to say it is OK to think about these other ways of doing things. And, and that's the big issue. Unless you've got that, th these teachers are pressurised by unions, by their local authority, who are their employers. So it's really trying to create an environment which has grown up and people can have an open and honest debate about different ways of doing things. And I'm pretty sure there are better ways of doing things than how they're currently being done. OK, back to you. Let's have another three or four questions or comments. Gentleman in the middle, and then we'll go to one near the back. Hi, yes. Is this on? Is it? Yes. Lawrence, Lawrence Howells, uh, Chief Executive, Scottish Funding Council. Um, I guess my concern here is, uh, is what is there in this proposal that's going to change practice? Because it's practice in the classroom or you know, in, in the school or in how the schools run. Um, that's going to make a difference um, and you know I'd like to see that connection or maybe it's in the paper you know because what really makes the difference is is practice it's what happens happens between the pupils in the school or pupils in the teacher and uh, and I'm absolutely for us finding ways to do more and better in that respect but I, I just can't quite see the connection between the the, the legislative proposal and, and that thank you uh, yeah sorry uh, David Gow again I'm uh Inter Alia, editor of Skeptical.scot, which is an online magazine, uh, but also a former education uh, editor and a former governor of a London borough of Islington Secondary School. Uh, now, a, I just wanted to bear out what, on, on that point of what, uh, what Eileen was saying, which is about leadership, which is, I mean, as a, as a journalist, I've visited schools all over the place, including places like Harlem, where in New York, upper, uh, you know, on the Upper East Side, where uh, it was schools were absolutely, tra some schools, not all of them, some schools were transformed. It was entirely due to the leadership of the, of the, of the head. But only, and the same goes for the schools I was involved with, the schools I was involved with as a LEA governor, that is, in, in London, in a London, uh, where uh, the, the head, the head teacher, but working in conjunction with the senior leadership team, the senior management team, and also parents, but also, and the governing body, they were working as a whole in order to drive up standards, to close precisely the attainment gap, which we all talk about here. And, a, and if, for example, parents were not taking part or you know, were proving a bit recalcitrant, frankly, the head would ring them up and tell them, uh, get your ass down this school straight away. Otherwise, you, know, you and or your kid are in trouble. We didn't put it quite as crudely as that, but he put it fairly crudely, it must be said. So I think there is that, there is that sort of role. Um, you're right in the sense that what, um, sorry, is it Bill? Yeah. Yeah, we're well, saying about the, uh, you know, I mean, there are some very deeply conservative forces here, not least in the EIS. And I think, um, you know, many of these have to be overcome. Um, fortunately, in a way, the First Minister has shown a certain... Um, regard for change and indeed has expressed some interest not least here in the um uh, in the london challenge and and the, all those things but i mean i fear that there is i mean we've asked these questions uh, earlier this year of all the political leadership here all the various the, the you know the five main political leaders and there was not much appetite for the kind of change which don is and or some of you are putting forward so I'd like the panel at least to address how do they think 
there could be this kind of political change brought about. Okay. A gentleman near the front. The same. Michael Vickers, how does this proposal uh, on the table right, go towards reducing the inequality between schools across Scotland, which is a major concern of the Scottish Government at the moment? Okay, get some panel comment now. Start with you this time, Bill. Uh, really, on, on the first the first question, I think I'll try and swerve the second one. It's too complicated for me. That uh, on, on the whole question, it is about ownership of education. It's about a team effort. It's about getting the best possible teacher, and if you can hire and fire them, even better, as far as I'm concerned, because the best teachers should be in, in, in charge. Uh, my second project that I'd looked at, and it was really following Professor Hattie, and it's slightly linked to, to the first question, it's about getting the best possible teachers in place with the subject matter knowledge and the ability to convey that knowledge in a meaningful way to the pupil. And I'd looked at some sort of teacher reprogramming, almost a reboot centre for some teachers, because there's a lot of teachers in the profession, and in my opinion, possibly shouldn't be there. Whilst there's a lot of teachers there that I think are first class, but they should be supported by parents and the kids should be in a receptive place where they are up and whether they sign a legal agreement or some contractual agreement that they're actually there to sc at school to learn. Because I was horrified when I actually went round various schools and there's people that choose not to go to school. There's selective mutism. There's a whole series of psychological problems that kids are using not to go to school. And for me, I, I don't think it should be a choice thing. I mean, it, it should be a team effort and everybody should be there to learn. But, but it is, and it does need to be reinforced from the top. I mean, I've been working now with the government for about a year and a half, the first business plan went in a year and a half ago. For the first minister to turn around now and say, well, we've actually wasted your time for the last year and a half, because on the back of that, other business plans have gone in on the strength that she's open to ideas that work, we've presented them, and we've got even more to come forward. So I'm hoping that the government are in a sort of receptive place for a new way of doing things. Or, or we've been wasting our time for the last year and a half. Thank, thank, th thanks, Bill. Um, I just want to go back to Lawrence's point about practice and tie that into um, leadership and so just sort of drawing on Robinson's review of leadership practices that make that make make a difference. Because um, if it, you know, is, is it changing the curriculum? Is it ch changing structures? N no, it's not. It's investing in professional learning that makes a difference. The effect size is around about 0.8, which is twice any of the other characteristics they, they identified. So you know, I, I would say if, we, if this proposal is to work, professional learning needs to be at the fore. Um, and I, I then go back to my point about um, it being a collective act activity. So I, I can think two weeks ago, I was in the South Bronx working with groups of teachers from four different schools um, on, on the same campus, undertaking collaborative, systematic inquiry into each other's practice. And if the focus of that inquiry is, is around closing the attainment gap, then we might then come on to address some of the points raised in, in the final question. But you know, I would say the model has to put professional learning across classroom boundaries, across school boundaries, and across regional boundaries at the forefront of it. Eileen. I can't say that I would be buying into Bill's vision of Dickensian education. Um, I th one of the frustrations that I feel constantly about in our work with schools is that many teachers and many school leaders do, do yes, understand the capacities within families and that unlocking that capacity is actually part of the process of educational success for their young people. However, Many in our schools don't know how to do that. Um, and in fact, it's not part of our teacher education program. We don't explain to teachers what the role of parents and family is. We don't help them to understand how they can unlock that potential. Um, and so we are where we are. Um, and in fact, those children, those young people, which the education system, some would say, is failing, actually, it's the families they're failing because they are failing to engage the families of these young people who have all sorts of issues going on in their lives very often. Um, this, is, this is just 
nothing to do with anything other than the fact that Dawn mentioned self-directed support. And I'll just throw in a little um, personal experience here because as a mum of an 18-year-old who has a, a disability, we are on that journey of self-directed support. And the idea, and I campaigned for it many years ago, was around autonomy and control. But actually, the reality is um, families who are having to battle local authorities to get a reasonable budget, to get that budget presented in a way that is workable, and then to find opportunities, services, whatever, for the young people, because actually the very act of creating self-directed support has um, ensured that very many services and supports that were there for families previously have withered because they have no, no steady income. So I simply share that with you because there was a great idea, and as I say, I campaigned for it. Um, but in fact, the burden that it places on families having to employ people as an individual to employ people and to manage and performance manage people, as well as to find the supports and the services and the opportunities that are going to actually make the life of their loved one worthwhile. And so um, I would I really would return to the so um, I would I really would return to the issue of leadership. I think that that there are very many great school leaders. It's a shame Gavin Clark isn't here from, from East Lothian also. Um, I know Gavin because I've visited the school and seen what, what he's doing there. Um, and that is courageous school leadership. And um, I can remember him describing to me that as he was introducing his model of senior phase, it felt like standing naked in the field. And I can completely understand that. But he was brave enough to do that and I didn't peek. So... Um, yes, there are, there are great powers out there. There are the unions. There, are, there is local government, you know. Um, so change is not an easy prospect. I will return to the point that, that for many families who are involved with education, they see local authorities as a break anchor on change and development and the rigidity and the short-termism of local authorities as being a real issue. Um, and so I can completely see why the prospect of taking education out of local authority control on one level is, 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 is an attractive one. But I can also see in very many cases there is support and that thing even just about employing people and ha doing all of that stuff um, is a very attractive option. So I'm torn, I suppose I would say, but I think you know if there were one magic bullet... Um, to resolve very many of the issues that we have. It's leadership. I think Chris would like just another point, and then yeah, we'll take I, one more comment. I, I, just, I just think we have to be a little bit cautious, because, um, yeah, there is no panacea. There's no magic bullet. The, the take, Taking schools out of local authority control isn't the answer on, on its own. You only have to look south, south of the border. You know, low-performing academy chains replicate the same characteristics of low-performing local authorities. So just a, you know, a note of caution, I think. Okay. Anybody like to get in a last comment? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Neil McLennan. I'd just like to say I agree with Eileen's point. I was the, the chair of our parent council and a school board in West Lothian, and Three of the head teachers I worked with went on to be directors of education, and none of them, to my mind, had a problem with raising standards in the, the school that I had an interest in. So I think the leadership point is key. But the thing I'm interested in is this, um, the issue of democratic accountability. And I just wonder how you think that breaking the link with local authorities, what that would do in terms of democratic accountability, because at the moment that's obviously expressed through councillors. Um, we do, in a sense, seem to be all over the place with this at the moment because that local authority link has been broken with the police service. Uh, you know, everybody's got an opinion in terms of how that's gone. And Reform Scotland are pushing for local health boards to be brought uh, under, the, under the control of local authorities and that democratic link. 
How, how do, we th do we think that that democratic accountability has any role at all? Because if you're going to take the schools out of, uh, break that link with local authorities, you're going to lose it. And, and how is that accountability going to be expressed? Okay. I'll let you have a shot as well, because we're not really going to have time to return to the panel. Uh, Ross McPhail, um, work for Adam and Company. My, you know, if it comes down to leadership and talent, we keep going back to that. How would you attract the right people into teaching to begin with in terms of teacher training? How do you go about attracting the dynamic people you want to take the profession forward? Okay. I was firmly told that I had to finish the session by 7.30, <laughs> and that I intend to do, which means I shall not go back around the panel, but it doesn't mean there isn't time for me. Uh, so if I can comment, <laughs> I can comment on a, on a couple of things. There is nothing in Don's proposition with which I disagree. I wonder, however, whether it is in tune with the needs of the immediate moment. Uh, I suspect that now that the government has very firmly stated the priority that it attaches to education, and put in place a cabinet secretary who has obviously got the muscle to do something about that, that we are going to see some quite large changes over the next year to two years. And it's against that background that I question whether a three-year pilot uh, will have the influence on what then takes place that uh, Don might be anticipating. Um, I say that, of course, having a career-long proven track record of overestimating the decisiveness and courage of governments and the willingness of other components of the system to change. Um, but it does seem to me that there are some interesting issues that we might want to address. Um, we will, I think, see something done about school autonomy and we may see something done about governance and the structure of local government. But if these things, which would be big and dramatic changes, take place within the lifetime of this government, they will take place early in the lifetime of this government, not when the next election is approaching. I think also it's worth contemplating the kind of change that uh, is now required. And in this context, the OECD report of before Christmas, with its recommendation that what it described as the middle in Scottish education should be strengthened. It seems to me the concept of the middle has dramatically changed since the 1980 Act to which OECD referred. They referred to it in order to say it was clear then local authorities were the middle, and it's clear now that they no longer have the resource and capacity to discharge what was thought of as the function of the middle in 1980. Uh, and maybe we're now talking about a middle that is much more fuzzy than simply the se centre section of a three-tier hierarchy, that is more concerned with changing culture, with matters of um, uh, relationships, with developing networking among teachers, uh, and so on. And that what needs to be put in place is not traditional structural change, but something of a rather different nature. And finally from me, there seem to be broad agreement, not unanimous, but broad agreement, that we do favour the idea of school autonomy and hope that the government will act on this. I hope that if they act on school autonomy, they will remember that schools require to be autonomous, not just from local authorities, but from them as well. So in bringing matters to a close, can I ask you to thank various people, uh, very grateful to the David Hume Institute for organising the event and uh, the Royal Society of Edinburgh for hosting it, and also my panellists for contributing their thoughts as the evening has progressed. But above all, of course, I'm sure we're all extremely grateful to Don for the work that he's put into producing his proposal and the skill with which he has set it out for us at the beginning of the evening. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Keir. You neglected to thank yourself uh, for chairing the discussion so ably. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I mean, David Hume said that progress comes from argument among friends, and I hope we, we certainly had an argument. I hope we're still friends. Um, we will uh, buy you a drink outside to continue the discussion, because this is an issue, I think, which cannot be resolved in a yes or no fashion. There are lots of ramifications for it which we need to discuss. But it was a slightly different way of doing things than our normal uh, events, and I hope that you found it stimulating in any way. Can I again thank the panelists and thank Don for his proposal and Tamashanta Trust for sponsoring the evening. Our next event is um, June the 2nd, very different, the EU referendum campaign. You may have heard of it. Uh, we have produced, uh, in conjunction with the Centre on Constitutional Change and the Hunter Foundation, uh, a free e-book on matters pertaining to the EU referendum campaign. It, apart from two chapters, one arguing for and one arguing against, the rest of it is entirely impartial and uh, factual based, so I urge you to download that from the David Hume website. But next on uh, June the 2nd, we have three of the authors coming to talk to us and to answer your questions. It's not here. It is in the Edinburgh University Business School in Buckloo Place, but I urge you to come along if you're interested in that campaign. And now, can I thank everybody again and invite you to join us outside. Thank you. <laughs>